morning and welcome to my presentation. I'm Birte from the Leuven and I will explain to you how you can light up fluorescence microscopy with the main specific languages. Why would you use fluorescence microscopy? Well, when you want to look at a nanometer scale or micrometer scale at cells, tissue or organisms in general, we use microscopes. There are several microscope techniques and one of them is fluorescence microscopy. It is particularly interesting because it's a non-invasive technique, which means you won't harm the sample. Secondly, it is also very selective, meaning that you can look separately at the nucleus, at the mitochondria or some other structures by selectively labeling only uh, this structure. Furthermore, sample preparation is very simple and there's a wide range of fluorescent probes available. Now to understand how we can use DSLs for fluorescence microscopy, we first have to understand what fluorescence microscopy is. So let's start with what is fluorescence. Fluorescence is the emission of light by a substance that has absorbed a photon. Let me try to explain you by this Jablonski diagram. Assume that we have a molecule that is at the ground state. This molecule will absorb energy, which is usually in the form of light. This absorption of light happens at a certain wavelength. This is why we represent the arrow in purple. So assume we absorb UV uh, light. Then this molecule will go to an excited state. And in this excited state, it will slowly fall back to the zeroth level by non-radiative transitions. Non-radiative transitions could be vibrations or internal conversions, but in each case they are transitions that do not emit light. If the molecule then falls back from the excited state to the ground state, fluorescence will happen. As you can see, we indicate this by a green arrow, meaning that the fluorescence happens at a different wavelength than the absorption has taken place. You can find fluorescent proteins in nature. For instance, jellyfish carry the GFP or the green fluorescent protein. They exhibit a bright green light when they are exposed, exposed to UV light. The scientists Tsin, Shimomura and Chalfi were awarded the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their discovery and development of the green fluorescent protein. But also, in your everyday life, you can experience fluorescence. For instance, when you put your tonic water under black light or an ultraviolet light, the quinine content causes it to fluoresce in blue. So you can see that it will start to shine a bright blue light. Now that we understand what fluorescence is, let's look at the simplest possible setup for doing fluorescence microscopy. First of all, you need a light source, which is usually a laser or a LED. And next to that, you will need a filter. This filter will make sure that only monochromatic light passes, so we will work with a single wavelength. If we now follow the green arrows, we reflect on a dichroic mirror and pass through the objectives going to the cells. If these cells are fluorescently labels, labeled, they will absorb the light that, is, that they are exposed to and emit a different color of fluorescent light. This is indicated by the red arrow in the drawing. So this other light, this fluorescent light, will pass through the objectives and through the mirrors, through another filter to the detector, which is usually a camera. This last filter is called the emission filter. And this one should be there to filter out all noise or uh, environmental light or um, excitation light in order to only look at the fluorescent light at the camera. You can compare this filter to, having, to needing a dark room when you want to use black lights. 
So you can only see the black lights on white clothes, shining some kind of blue uh, light, if the room is dark. If the light is on, you won't see anything. So this indicates that you need to filter out all um, other light in the environment. Now, you might not be very familiar with fluorescence or fluorescence microscopy, but actually it is used everywhere. Only at the KU Leuven, every biology lab has at least one fluorescent microscope. But also these companies such as Rush, Johnson & Johnson, Galapagos and others, they all use fluorescent microscopes to do research and um, develop their products. For instance, in their race in looking for a corona vaccine, they all use fluorescent microscopes. In 2018, the global market size of fluorescence microscopy was about $550 million. But also companies such as Nikon, Perk and Elmer, to name but a few, they build fluorescent microscopes and sell them to their customers. Then we have journals such as Cell or Nature, which are actually uh, journals with a very high impact factor of about 40. And in all or most of their publications, they use one kind of technique of fluorescence microscopy uh, for doing their studies. So this sounds as a nice story. <coughs> fluorescence microscopy is used everywhere and it is nice. So you must be wondering what the problem is. Well, I will explain you. The technical complexity and the price of these instruments is growing every year. You need a lot more hardware to adapt to the experimental strategy or to support multiple kinds of fluorescence microscopy techniques or to have more accurate acquisitions. So as you can see, these, these um, instruments or the setup is not as simple as I showed you on a few slides before this one. It's actually way more complex um, and technical than this. This means that we need dedicated staff members to operate these machines. And especially in a research setting, this is a problem. You can imagine that people doing research on, on cells, they just want to um, look at the data and don't want to spend time figuring out how the machine works. But what the actual case is, is that they have to spend most or half of their time trying to understand how the machine works and understand every single detail in order to use it to its full potential. Generally, it takes months to years before a user or an operator becomes fully proficient with uh, the instrument. So, what's the clue? Well, we realized that setting up an experiment in fluorescence microscopy is actually similar to writing a computer program. And this computer program should be able to do three things. First of all, it should be able to communicate with a graphical user interface or a GUI. This GUI is provided in Igor Pro. Igor Pro is software that is used often in a biomedical setting or a chemical setting for interpreting images or doing data acquisition. Communication with the GUI happens via serialized JSON objects via a socket. The user interface then pulls to see if data is available. Secondly, our computer program should be able to communicate with hardware. There are several kinds of hardware in a microscope. Think about a stage, a camera or other detection systems, dichroic mirrors, filter wheels, to name but a few. Communication with the hardware happens via COM ports, so this is serial communication. Sometimes a DLL is provided, written in C, by the manufacturer of the hardware, so our program should be able to support all these kinds of hardware and their, um, and their features. Last but not least, our computer program should be able to represent and reason over domain-specific knowledge. And this last requirement naturally brings us to a domain-specific language, or DSL. Now, what is a DSL actually? You can actually compare it to 
Lego blocks. You start with some very simple and small building blocks that you can compose in different ways to build all kinds of structures, as you can see here. But in a domain-specific language, we not only have this, this building, these building blocks and their composition, it is also an actual programming language. So we need to define syntax and semantics. The advantage of using a DSL or domain-specific language is that we can choose our own syntax and semantics. There are two kinds of DSLs. We have internal or embedded domain-specific languages, and we have external domain-specific languages. We will use the former. Why? Because DSLs, internal DSLs, are embedded in a so-called host language. This means that we can piggyback on the features of this host language. Think about a debugger, a compiler, or more. We won't have to write them ourselves for a domain-specific language. We can use it from the host language. In our example, so for fluorescence microscopy experiments, we will choose as a host language Haskell. And this is not only because of its nice type system and the lazy evaluation, it's also because it's perfectly fit for DSL development. Furthermore, it is at the spare head of programming language design, which gives us access to the most recent programming language features. All right, let's have a look at a fragment of this domain-specific language for fluorescence microscopy experiments. The building blocks for this DSL are measurement elements, such as detect, wait for a couple of seconds, these seconds are represented by a double, or irradiate for a duration and a certain power, both represented by a double. Note that we can use our own domain-specific syntax for representing these measurement elements, which we can extend this a bit. We also have recursive measurement elements, such as do times, which represents a loop, executing a program for a certain number of times. And this number is represented by the int in the program. You can also have a stage loop going over several stage positions and executing the program on every, every stage position. A stage position is represented by an x, y, and z component um, and actually represents a, a certain position at a stage or of the sample. Note that a program is now a sequence or actually a list of measurement elements. All right, to embed a domain-specific language in a host language, we have two choices. We can either choose for a deep embedding or a shallow embedding. With the deep embedding, terms in the DSL are implemented to construct an abstract syntax tree, which is then traversed for evaluation. With a shallow embedding, terms in the domain-specific language are implemented directly by their semantics, bypassing the intermediate abstract syntax tree and its traversal. Here in this slide, we show how a deep embedding works. Remember the data types we defined in the previous slide. You can see them here in the box. We pattern match on the constructors to define the semantics in the execute function. This is actually the traversal of the abstract syntax tree. Let's look at an, ex at an example. If we execute wait for a certain duration, we actually call the functional function thread delay, which is a function of our host language Haskell, so we can make use of it. As we are working in a monad M, we also have control over the side effects that are happening in the program. On the other hand, we want to look at the shallow embedding. In the shallow embedding, tapes, types or data types are not very meaningful in this case. You can see that the semantics or the meaning of terms in the domain-specific language 
is directly implemented in their constructors. So now we have a separate function for each constructor. We have detect, wait, irradiate, times and loop. As you can see, wait duration now it directly carries its semantics in the function. Executing a measurement element now means just returning the measurement element, as its meaning or semantics is directly implemented in its definition. Executing a program remains the same. Let us now do some more technical stuff. We can start juggling with the data types. Let's start from the deep embedding that we defined before. We had a type constructor for each term in the DSL. You can see it here in the box again. We can encode these measurement elements as a generalized algebraic data structure or a GADT. Programs remain the same. You can see it here, the similarity between our first implementation and this one. We still have a detect, wait, irradiate, do times and stage loop. Just the form of implementation is different. We use a GADT instead of simple data type. In the next step, we can merge program, prog, and measurement element into a single structure. Well, we can do that by realizing that program is a list of measurement elements. So it can be either the empty list or a list with a head and a tail. As you can see, we added some elements in bold here. We added empty, representing the empty list, and we added a program to each uh, other type constructor in bold, which represents the tail of the list. Note that we still have base cases and recursive cases. We can also define two simple operations, empty and append. Empty represents the base case or the unit and it's just equal to the empty constructor that we determine that we defined in our program. Append is represented by a double semicolon and can append two programs. The implementation is left out here um, because it's not very relevant. Now we can we have realized that these functions together with the program GADT form a monoid. A monoid is an algebraic data structure that is particularly interesting for parallel computing or for reasoning over data structures. The requirements for a monoid is that it should have a set of objects, which are here uh, the programs. It should have an operation between these objects, which is here the double semicolon or the append function. And we should have a unit element, which is here uh, empty. So we have juggled with, the G with some data types and the monoids and see that we can have good control over the structure of our program this way. So let us conclude. We can say that domain specific languages or DSLs are intuitive programming tools for domain experts. Fluorescence microscopy benefits for it, from it by using it to increase their productivity. That's why we will have a corona vaccine in a few months, maybe. But it is already actively used at the nanobiology group at the KU Leuven. They use the following interface um, to construct their programs. So as you can see, these buttons correspond to the data type or the type constructors we defined. And these are actually the, the smaller building blocks that they can compose in a different ways to construct a program they want to execute. But this fluorescence microscopy is not the only success story. There are multiple DSLs around in the world. Think about Haxel, which is a DSL by Facebook that they use for fighting spam. But also famous DSLs such as C CSS or RegExes have become very successful. Pyro what you can see on the right, is a probabilistic domain-specific language that is used by Uber to model, um, to model their traffic. 
So, I want to thank you very carefully for, for listening. But if you want to know more about domain-specific languages or DSLs, you should join our workshop in the afternoon, which is, it is called On a Date with DSLs. I would be happy to answer any of your questions and thank you for listening again. Hello. Hello, hi Birte. Uh, thank you for uh, for the, the talk. Uh, it's uh, quite complex for someone like me. <laughs> so uh, I, I think I would be a good candidate uh, for the workshop uh, later today. Um, now, uh, there are some questions already uh, in the stage, so I will will go over them um, one by one because we have uh, some time as well to spend on. Uh, so, uh, a question from James, I think, or from Frank, I don't know because I'm here the moderator as now. <laughs> okay. uh, James is busy. Um, so, um, you mentioned the lazy evaluation Haskell, uh, which is uh, a very nice feature. I mean, James is also very fond of Haskell, in fact. Uh, so, is this uh, more a general question on, on this specific language or, or, I mean, does it make uh, by far more sense for, for your set up uh, for the DSL in microscopy experiments. So in general, this is a useful feature of Haskell that it has this lazy evaluation. Um, in my DSL, I could use it when I have infinite lists, which could be uh, the data that is coming in. I could handle it uh, case by case uh, as a sort of stream. Mm -hmm. So there I could use uh, the lazy evaluation within the fragments that I showed here. Uh, lazy evaluation is not that important, mm -hmm. but I do use it for, for some other stuff. Mm -hmm. And you also said that uh, you already have some candidates, of course, in, in the nanobiology group uh, using uh, your, your DSL development. So it's still very fresh. Huh? So just, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, but, uh, people actually use it there. And I also, when I uh, develop the DSL, I do it together with them in order to really uh, respond to their feature requests and what, mm. what they actually want to have uh, in yeah, this yeah, very good. I think yeah, that's always uh, the crucial thing to have, uh, you know, people use use it, but then also have uh, good support because yeah, that's that's also very very um, crucial as as we know from from our bioinformatics facility here. Um, so there's another question on this uh, iconic uh, piglet with the fireworks. In fact, uh, which uh, is borrowed or or copied. I don't know exactly from from uh, Bartosz Milewski's book. Um, so, so have you put out some inspiration of that book, in fact, uh, by designing your DSL? Yes, so the theory and also the book is all about category theory and it all goes about uh, composition. And also this DSL consists of building blocks, which we can compose in a very smart uh, way. So it's definitely based on the book and I um, put this image there on purpose because it's, it's actually the image he uses for a monoid. Mm -hmm. where the, the pig is a single category and the arrows that he's throwing in the air uh, are the morphisms, um, which corresponds again to um, the composition function that I that I defined there. Okay, um, very good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as usually people have to get their inspiration um, somewhere, yeah. Um, there's also one, one short question uh, on... Um, the GADTs, which is not here in the stage, I will copy it in a second there. Um, so could you explain a little bit what these GADTs are, in fact, and, and what other programming language, if you know, uh, in fact, uh, also support them? So, I mean, yeah. is it only specific to, to Haskell then, or, or is it, it is broad, again, more yeah, broad, explainable? It is again a useful feature of Haskell. It's actually a different way to represent your data structures. And mm -hmm. again, we can start from these uh, GADTs to, um, well, convert programs to algebraic structures such as monoids or recognize monads in them. And if we have these, can recognize these algebraic structures, we can easily uh, prove properties about our programs or have better control over what it does, like control over the side effects, which we have in, in monads. So it's again, a nice feature of Haskell. Mm -hmm. And and is there any other uh, languages which also use the same concept, or or does it really take a lot of time uh, from of other uh, languages to pick up the, these concepts? Well, um, some languages are slowly picking up um, um, functional programming features. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, the lambdas that you can use in in, in Java or uh, Scala, which also 
takes more of this approach, but it's it's a slow evolution, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you know, <laughs> the paradigms in programming. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not a, a hardcore programmer, but I learned now from my colleagues that yeah, <laughs> there's there's these people and the others, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good. Uh, you you showed also the, the this uh, graphical user interface uh, from from the bio uh, from the nanobiology group. Um, so is that also done in Haskell or or any other language? Um, so um, the user interface is written in Igor Pro, as I also mentioned in the presentation. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just software that is often used for for um, well um, analyzing images in the context of. Um, microscopes, microscopy experiments, um, but it actually directly translates to the DSL and Haskell. So it's just it's just a user interface. It doesn't mm -hmm. have a, that much functionality. It it directly translates to the building blocks. Okay. Um, I define but could, could you then also use like uh, the Fiji or so, uh, which as, as front end to, to your DSL, yes. or is there a lot of extra steps needed in between? We could to, actually to... use any user interface that we would want to, but. This is just mm -hmm. because, common, and they knew it in the yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, because uh, I mean, I know from our bioimaging facility, of course, Fiji is there very big, or Image Day, so that could be, of course, another option to to make the, the, your DSL more popular. If if you have some yeah. some added benefits uh, to a very already large uh, existing uh, community, in fact. We also yeah. use uh, Image Day for some different different features uh, that also um, correspond with or. Um, communicate with the Haskell DSL, but just the specific mm -hmm. user interfaces uh, in IgroPro. Okay, so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, one last question here. Um, so, I, uh, about Haskell more philosophically, I, I think, so elegant and powerful as Haskell is, uh, it's not so widely used. Uh, so, so, I mean, how, how do you see the, the ecosystem around Haskell evolving in the future? if you think about the, the strengths and also the weaknesses uh, the language has. Yeah, so Haskell definitely have its, has its uh, strengths, but I like, like the, the type system, the lazy evaluation, but also that it is perfectly fit for embedding these, these DSLs. But I also know that it has quite a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, but once you are, uh, well, you know the basics and you know how to work with Haskell, you can do very nice stuff with it. And also these domain specific languages that we embed in Haskell, the users of the of the domain specific language won't have to know all the features of Haskell. They can use it yeah, you abstract it away, language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's actually yeah. the purpose of doing it. And and the, the message I want to to give to you that if we have these DSLs and we have some programmers that can make them easily in Haskell, the users don't have to be programmers themselves themselves in order to well program in, in their semantics and syntax uh, mm -hmm. as they would want to yeah i mean that's uh, we have uh, we have shortly talked about uh, the the workflow system and nextflow was there as well so to you is also experimenting with that in our group a little bit and and we do as well so it's uh, yeah it's exactly this idea even if sometimes i i'm kind of like ooh, it's still reasonably complex so you need sometimes you'll twist your head a little bit but i mean that's that's normal Good. Okay. Thank you again, um, Birte, for your your uh, participation and your chat and also the Q&A. I just want to announce again that, um, as Tür has also put in the stage, uh, for your very workshop in the afternoon, uh, you need to set up some accounts uh, together with, with your uh, colleague Tom. So please use the, the form stack still uh, to, to register yourself so that uh, Tom and Birte or Birte and Tom uh, our ad speeds uh, at the session uh, in the afternoon. Good, again, thank you, Birte, also from my side. Thank you for the <laughs>